Well, bollocks, I've fallen down the AGS hole again, haven't I? The AGS hole, you might say, but probably shouldn't, never, not ever those words. Even better, this game's from 2014, so I'm about two years late. So today we talk about the Samaritan Paradox, created by Faravid Interactive, I hope I'm saying that right, who for some reason get a far less flashy splash animation than Screen 7. I can only assume they're the game's publisher, information on their role is surprisingly hard to find. Either way, I can finally tick off Play a Point and Click Adventure set in 1980s Sweden. Square that away, finally. Now, this game is not amazing. In fact, there's quite a lot wrong with it. The graphics are a bit dull and lacking in detail, the frame rate is low, the interface is less intuitive than it could be, the older AGS engine version it uses limits your resolution options, it has some pretty rubbish puzzles, inconsistent design and the ending is fucked up. But it actually does some interesting things that I think are worth talking about. If you want something to keep you interested, this game contains one of my favourite adventure game puzzles in recent years, even if I had to look at a walkthrough to beat it. Good enough? Okay, let's do a story. We start off in Gothenburg 1984, or at least with the words Gothenburg 1984. Ord Salomon is a guy who cracks codes, we are told, by Ord himself. Observe him half listening to a news report when his phone rings. Now, this is where the game decides to give you control, so it's actually quite hard to pin down where the intro ends. Personally, the point where Ord reaches the mansion seems right to me, but you've already solved a puzzle by that point. The game kind of jumps straight in like that. It's not unheard of. I mean, where does Dave the Tentacle start? When the trio get to the mansion, when Bernard has to find the Super Barry plans, when he sends the plans to Hogate, it's not obvious. So not a bad design choice I'd say, but it does make talking about the story a bit trickier. To continue my recap, Ord's friend Magnus calls to check on him and suggests reading the book he sent over to take Ord's mind off writing his thesis. The book happens to be by a world famous journalist turned writer, Jonathan Bergman, who died a few months prior. When you know it, the codebreaker finds a hidden code on page one, deciphers the secret message and with a little encouragement slash threat from his friend, contacts the late author's daughter Sarah. They conclude that her father wrote one more book, a book that she'll have to follow his clues to find, a book which is the key to her inheritance. Dick move off her guy. Given that she went into an entirely different field to avoid walking in her father's puzzly footsteps, Sarah arranges to have Ord follow the trail instead, with the promise of splitting the inheritance with him. I swear, this seemed a lot less complex when I was playing it. I might as well tackle some obvious badness first. You've got these backgrounds that look a little more early 90s than they really needed to be. Portraits that look like somebody ran a paintbrush filter over them in Photoshop. Other image editing suites are available. But you do get a choice of font. That ain't nothing. You might want to pick that one early on, by the way, because almost none of the descriptions are voiced, so you'll be doing a lot of reading. Back to the options for a moment, I've never been fond of using the floppy disk and arrow icons for saving and loading. It's not difficult to work out which is which, but they look too similar. I'd rather have something I can tell apart instantly. Call me nitpicky if you must, and if so, welcome to my channel for obviously the first time, but I don't want to be going, time to save. Damn it every time, or even worse, accidentally loading a save instead of overwriting one and losing your progress. Also, and I realise there may be translation terrors at work here, some of the dialogue is a bit clumsy and haphazardly written, it can come off as unnatural. And it is father's wish that I search for it and find it and read it. Then again, translation does not excuse poor line reads. Sarah's mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a couple years ago. It's sad. Is it? I. It doesn't excuse wild variations in sound quality either, but that's more of a low-budget indie game problem. And while we're in the ballpark of dialogue, as much as I prefer unique interaction responses over generic ones, even generic responses are better than trying to use an item and getting no response whatsoever. Did I do it wrong? Is this the wrong thing to do? At best it'll seem obtuse, and at worst it'll seem like a mistake. I'm guessing the latter, because there are some generic responses in here which can be manipulated for humorous results. Might as well move right onto the interface at this point. It's my old favourite two-button interface combined with not actually my favourite pop-up inventory. It's also not my favourite interpretation of two-button, considering that some items have you left-click on them to examine them closely. It doesn't fit the use-look paradigm for me, but we're getting way into nitpick territory now. You've also got a notebook for all your important words and deeds, looking a lot more like the Blackwell interpretations than the Discworld Noir one, but as with both those examples, you can ask people about them. I like this better than simply showing the relevant dialogue option when you talk to the right person. In principle. It doesn't change the fact that you'd have to try every note on every person to find out if any of them advance the story. Thankfully, different plot points will get advanced in different ways, so you won't have to go around asking everyone where you can find some sailors. I would mention the game's hint system that the website advertises, but I never found it. Neither during my playthrough, nor when I specifically went looking for it. That only leaves one more part of the interface. This book icon here. 
Without spoiling too much, you will find individual chapters of a book over the course of the game. You might expect this gives you a wall of text to read, but this is one of the Samaritan Paradox's most unexpected ideas and one that I love. You don't read these chapters, you don't get a cutscene showing the events of these chapters, you play these chapters. Each one is part of a mini fantasy adventure and you play the crap out of them. It's more than simply a why the hell not approach to game development. At least one of the chapters gives you essential information for a puzzle back in the real world. I'd like to see that idea used again sometime. Very useful if you want to provide a little change of pace. Now on to something I can't say I love, but I can probably spend far too long talking about. The puzzles. On the one hand, you've got some cross-referencing puzzles, some riddles, the type of puzzle that makes you feel really smart for solving them rather than merely rubbing items together. There's nothing wrong with a bit of item rubbing, it's a staple of the genre if we're being honest, but it's even better when you can mix things up. I wouldn't call these puzzles extremely difficult, above average mostly, but it makes you feel that much smarter when you figure out a solution. I'd resist the urge to use a walkthrough for as long as possible with those if I were you. On the other hand, you have timed puzzles, more than I remember any other adventure game having. Worse than that, there's one that barely works, requiring you to stand in the exact right spot to avoid detection. I understand the urge to add some tension into what's usually a relaxed type of game, but I rarely see these done well, especially when they lead to game over scenarios. I say game over. The Samaritan Paradox will actually kick you back to a checkpoint in those situations, which is nice, even if failing a certain timed puzzle will boot you back into another timed puzzle bloody obsessed this lot. Then there's some straight up moon logic that made me feel a lot better about my walkthrough transgression earlier and one I have zero qualms about spoiling, so here we go. This guy has some evidence to show you but he won't take you to see it until he finishes his crossword which Ord solves all but one clue of. So you go to a bar, sit on the sofa, find some coins, give them to a guy standing next to a jukebox so he plays loud music and drives another guy out of there who leaves the book he was reading behind which just so happens to contain the last clue so you can give the first guy the completed crossword and go look at that evidence. This puzzle failed as soon as I had to sit on a sofa to solve a crossword puzzle. I'm gonna leave it at that. Finally, there's a puzzle which looks like this. I don't have to explain why this one is annoying, do I? No? Good. While I did like the premise of the game and the main character's cryptology feat in particular, I would argue that it falls apart towards the end. Not the fucked up ending so much. The rest of the game revolves around that cohesively, but there's a side plot which felt like it got wrapped up a little too quickly and neatly. I'm not even sure there was any point in setting it in 1980s Sweden at all. I guess it's part of the side plot, but not inseparably so. Best example I could find of 80s Swedishness was the main character complaining about the noisy trams. And believe me, when you've dealt with first bus and Scott Rail for as long as I have, the Gothenburg trams are amazing by comparison. Then again, I never rode them in 1984, so maybe that's it. Anyway, I'm not saying this have brought it to the modern day, nothing like that. I just hoped they would do more with the setting. While I can and will praise this game for trying some ideas outside of Normtown, it became harder and harder to recommend as I played on. Something I didn't mention was the option to decide a character's fate, but it kind of requires advanced knowledge knowledge you don't have when the option appears. That's the main problem of this game. Several good ideas, but too many of those ideas are poorly implemented. I haven't tried the free demo, so I don't know how representative it'll be of all these flaws, but nonetheless, props to the dev team for providing one in the first place. The Samaritan Paradox might prove to be an interesting proposition, but more than anything, I want to see some of these ideas implemented in a better game. Oh, and if you press escape in this cutscene, it crashes. Just escape. Just press it and, and crash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 